Okay, I'm going to try this again. It seems like I'm getting less and less time from YouTube, um, which is trying not to get annoyed by that, but I'm down to, I got cut off at a little less than nine minutes. So in the following uh, meditation written today on this day, the 20th of May, originally 10 years ago, and I'm commemorating it today, this is material that is in Chapter 7 of this book right here that is where the material ultimately was published. Um, yeah, being and learning. Chapter 7, pages 159 to 160. And uh, in this particular part of the meditations, I'm following in the wake of an analysis of Heraclitus, uh, where I focused on really the gesture of teaching that is one of being able to show without saying. So what at the limits of language, and this is important, at the, at the limit of language, what opens up is the possibility um, and the experience with that pure possibility. So the excess of, and so in the meditation I'm about to read, I talk about, I further explore this idea of the poets renouncing of their claim on language and in that renouncing of the claim on language, they are announcing hearing. So in renouncing speaking, we announce listening. And in announcing listening, we are opening up a space for hearing what others have to say. And that's the space of dialogue, and that's the space where um, learning, in the way that I'm wanting to emphasize it, is happening. Where we are taking up and working with uh, the excess that is always present, or le or beyond, I should say, what it is that we say. So beyond intentionality, beyond subjectivity, this is the key here. There's always more to be taken up. We can't. We what even whatever we say is always limited in in, in its moral. So now the, the meditation that takes this up. When the poet has learned renunciation, she has been released to the openness of the mediator, the one who announces, the one who can teach. If teaching is letting learning happen, then the one who has attained the proper comportment of hearing, who has caught sight of the ineffable, is the one who is most capable of teaching because she is far less sure of her capacity to speak, far less assured of the finality of her saying. When the poet has learned renunciation, she announces the limit of all mortal saying as mortal, as finite, as bounded. The mortality of each and every human saying announces the beyond, the ineffable, the unsaid, the not yet said, and thereby beckons authentic here. The mortal saying attains a kind of immortality in receiving the silence, the ineffable in the renunciation of speaking. For in the renouncement the word is gathered, and in this gathering appropriates the not yet, which remains unspoken in the mortal saying. Thus the mortal saying conserves possibility and safeguards meaning. The mortal saying spares meaning from the annihilation that appears as a specter haunting all human saying. To spare means to free from the snares of fatalism. Fatalism seeks to foreclose on meaning, on the initiative of hearing. Building ceases with the fatal draw brought on by the one who resists the appeal of language and insists upon the finality of their saying. Such saying is so-called heroic, the, the saying of the heroic speaker who follows the flight of Icarus, who turned a deaf ear to his teacher, his father, and after one brief heroic ascent to the sun, plunged to his death in the roaring currents of the sea. To renounce speaking before hearing is to announce the immortality of the word as the persistent dynamic unfolding of meaning. The one who bears this news is the sage, the teacher who is the guide, who leads the way because, quote, he is ahead of his apprentices in this alone. He has far more to learn than they. He has to learn to learn. The teacher must be capable of being more teachable than their apprentices. Quote from Heidegger. The teacher is the one who renounces the inherited depiction of the instructor and with it, quote, the authority of the know-it-all or the authoritative sway of the official. Unquote from Heidegger. 
To renounce this kind of authority is to abandon the location that positions the teacher above and beyond the student and thereby disrupts the symmetric reciprocity that establishes the conditions for the possibility of dialogic work. This renunciation is akin to the guy who abandons his post upon the parapet and appears as the liberator of the cave dweller in Plato's Allegory of the Cave. We did not exhaust the analysis of this mysterious one who appears from above, but we might imagine his state to be one of genuine uncertainty. He, whose identity has been most secure in the role of overseer, is far less sure of himself and appears as the one who is most teachable when he arrives to be the liberator. The liberator's act of liberation is initiated by the gift he offers, his submission to the other. In performing the role of guide, he has submitted himself to the one who he liberates, to the project of learning, to let the other learn. The sage submits herself to the apprentices in offering her teachability. She offers herself as the one who is most capable of learning from them, learning how they learn. The offering is made in the form of evocative saying, the provocative question, the directive which reposes the apprentice and compels him to take the questioning stand. The renunciation announces the arrival of the teacher as the one who guides, who lets learning happen who does not speak with the authority of the know-it-all, but, on the contrary, is attuned to the immortality of human saying. To be attuned to the immortality of human saying is to respond to the appeal of language and the originary status of hearing. Hearing is the comportment of the poet who has been released from the claim upon language and has instead been claimed by language and who has been put on the journey who has taken up the work of cultivating the community, the fellowship of peace. Thus, to be far less assured of the capacity to speak is to be steadfast in one's openness, and therefore far more responsive to the appeal of language. To have caught sight of the ineffable is to be put on the journey of learning, the cultivation of fellowship which unfolds in the purposeful wandering together. This fellowship is forged by painstaking listening. This is the building that makes the way for poetic dwelling. The beckoning of language that invites us to preserve the possibility of meaning making, to conserve the revolutionary, to seek the unforeseen. And that's how it ends. That's how it ended. That's how I ended that day. Ten years ago today, on the 20th of May, 2004, commemorated this day, the 20th of May, 2014. So check out the blog, Duarte Being and Learning, to see, uh, read rather, some commentary that's associated with this video, if you're interested.